come to our next lecture, lecture on computational heat and fluid flow. So yesterday we looked at the shock cooling problem, where we have initially a jump in density, for example, as given here, and lots of pressure, where we assume the velocity to be zero on both sides of the diagram. So this is one example of the Riemann curve. And we shall use now ideas that we have seen here just one discontinuity at all phases of our domain where we want to solve the oil equations using the finite body method. So that brings us then to Riemann solvers. And again, the framework is that we are discussing, we are at x, and we have here our vector u, so imagine its density, and we have our cells, and we focus, as usual, on the cell j, and we look at the phase xj plus one half. So that is the eastern phase, where we have here the neighbor xj plus one. So the, what we have in the finite volume method, that is we have the cell averages. For example, we have here, say, the uj, and we have here the uj plus 1. What we need to compute, what we would need to compute the flux exactly, would be the exact solution at the face. We don't have that, so we have to do an approximation. And the idea by Godunov was, let us define a Riemann problem, so here in the cell J, by the average in the cell, and that is in cell J, and by the average in the cell J plus 1. Then we have at this phase a Riemann problem, similar as we had for the shock tube problem. So that is the idea. So we define a Riemann problem, In our case, we do that for the one-dimensional Euler equations. And you remember, we wrote them in the form that we have the vector of the conservative variables, rho, rho u, rho e, plus the flux function, which we can express as a function of that is equal to zero. Um, we want to do that now to solve this for uh, at each cell phase, at each phase, with the following initial conditions. So at each phase, and we shall consider here the phase xj plus one half, and that is then 17. The initial condition is u of x0 is the state left, that is for x smaller than xj plus one half. In our case, it would be uj. And we have u right for x greater than xj plus one half. And that would be, in our case, uj plus one. So that is what we do with the first order. That would be the following, what we just have seen and what we just said, that we would choose the UL equal to the UJ and the U right equal to the UJ plus 1. So that would be then the choice by good enough. However, we saw already for the scalar conservation laws that we can get a higher order for second order or even higher order. However, if we have the TBD, it would be except for extrema, there it would be only first order. Then we would do the choice using the muscle approach with the limiter, for example, the minimum limiter. We would then take the extrapolated value from the left. And we would take for the right the extrapolated value to the right. So then we would have taken into account the neighbors and we would have some linear 
reconstruction, so we would get more accurate results. And we can use actually the same formula that we used for the scalar conservation law. Remember, the u here is the vector of the conserved variables. So remember, the u is the rho, rho u, and the rho e. I saw this morning there has been some confusion regarding the capital U, which is the vector of the conservative variables, and the velocity U. So please take them apart. They are two different things. The velocity is just what we know from physics, that is, in our case, the ratio of rho U and rho, if we have this, and U is the vector of the conservative variables, the capital U. So please have this distinction. Otherwise, it gets strong. So any, anyway, we do the muscle approach then for each of these components. And if you have programmed your minmod uh, limiter in the general way that I recommended, with a MATLAB with a point notation for, for getting element-wise multiplication, then you can apply it just to that. So then you do the muscle approach in the same way as we did for the scalar equation. And then we get higher order approximations for each component, rho, rho, rho u and rho e. And then we plug them in and they will then uh, come into our Riemann solver. There is a little remark here, and the remark you find more on that in the lecture notes is it is usually actually better not to extrapolate the conservative variables but the primitive variables. You can do the minimum also. Uh, limiting also on the slopes for rho, u, and e. So you can do, so that would be note, usually better, would be the muscle uh, for primitive variables. V. That is V. But the approach would be the same. You would then apply the, the min mod limiter then to the slopes of V. And the V, remember the V, that was the vector, the primitive verbs, rho, u, and t. But when you do this, I recommend you forget about this remark, just do the, the standard muscle approach of the conservative variables. When, when that is working, you can try this. Okay, but in any case, what we will get in the end is we will have values on the left and the right of our um, face. For example, if we had the, the, the muscle approach, we would have uh, some value down here for uh, I minus one. We would try to use that as well. And um, so we would then have uh, here for the first one, we would have these values here would then be our values that we take in the Riemann problem. If we have the extrapolated values, then we would take them that we get here. In the end, we have two values at the face, on the left and the right, and we use those then to solve our Riemann problem, um, to use the, the numerical flux function for that. So let us see. So then the Riemann problem that we get each phase that is for the Euler equations with this piecewise initial condition that we just discussed, that is so exactly by Goodenough's method. So that was Goodenough's main idea. So, and, and that is the same as we discussed for the scalar conservation laws. That was the same idea there. Then the scalar conservation laws with this piecewise initial condition is solved exactly. Here it is the Euler equations. There is, however, a problem here. Um, for the, linear, for the scalar conservation law, we got a formula that we could write down directly without any iteration. 
but for the Euler equations we need to do iterations because we get a nonlinear problem to solve it scalar, but nevertheless it has to be it's nonlinear and we have to solve it iteratively. So this approach is costly in the sense of computational time because of these iterations that we have to do to solve this nonlinear problem. And it turns out it is usually not necessary to solve it exactly. So instead, we can use much simpler approaches, similar one as we already have seen for the scalar conservation laws. And the simplest approach that you can think of that is the Lux Friedrichs method. Call that a simple but dissipative, so that it has a lot of numerical dissipation. Is Max Friedrich's method. we compute the numerical flux in the following way. Remember, we still want to know the flux at the phase xj plus one half. 18, and that is the flux function. Now I call it here with Lf, that is referring to Lex Friedrichs, at the phase j plus one half. The recipe is the same as we discussed for the scalar conservation laws. We take the central method for our problem, and in our problem we evaluate, it, we evaluate then the Euler flux function f with the values to the left of the face and with the values to the right of the face. The f that we have here, that is our flux function. So the f of u, that is the rho u, the rho u squared plus the pressure, and the rho e, the total energy, uh, rho e is the total energy per unit um, the volume, and that is then plus the pressure times the velocity. And again, I want to iterate on that. This is the velocity here, here, and here. And this is the vector of the conservative variables. So we evaluate now the flux function then with the value on the left of the face that we have for our Riemann problem and with the right. Take the average and then we subtract something that is then describing the numerical dissipation and it turns out for the lux friedrichs method we do the same as for the scalar conservation laws. We take the ratio of the grid spacing and the time step size, delta x over delta t and multiply by u right, again the capital U, minus u left. So that is the Lex Friedrichs method. You see, it is very simple because we have uh, just the values, well, that is typical for the Riemann, so we have just the values on the left and right involved, but this factor here makes it simple. We don't have to need anything but to compute the ratio of delta x and delta t. And you see immediately the problem. The problem is when we choose a small delta t, we will get a large numerical viscosity. Because remember, if we divide by delta x, multiply by delta x, then the numerical viscosity, just from the flux evaluation, will be delta x squared divided by 2 delta t. The 2 is from here. And you see when delta t goes to 0, this goes to infinity. So we get something that is no longer describing an implicit problem, but a viscous problem. We get a lot of numerical uh, viscosity for delta t to 0. Therefore, the method is essentially useless for small delta t. 
There is a method that we can simply improve on that, and that is the one that you are using in exercise 5, that is the local expert or the Rusanov method. So that is better. Let's see. So better is to use the Rusanov method. the same what I said before for the <coughs> scalar conservation law, which is also called the local x rays method. So that is that is the following. We have then the flux function at the phase j plus one half. Now I use here uh, the local exphrenics because the L, the R might also refer to rho. Local exphrenics or Rusanov. Doesn't matter. And it looks very much the same as this. So the difference will be this vector here. So we take again the average of the flux, that is the Euler flux that we just saw, evaluated with the state to the left and with the state to the right of the face. And then we take instead of this uh, ratio, d delta x and delta t, we take the fastest wave speed that we have locally and we call that modulus of that, a j plus one half. I'll define that in a minute. And that is times the difference in u r and u left. So now the, the catch is the a, the modulus of the fastest wave speed. And that is the following, a j plus one half is the maximum, what are our wave speeds? Remember, these are the eigenvalues of the coefficients for the order equations or the Jacobi. u minus c, u and u plus c. And the fastest one in absolute value is u plus c, modulus of u. And we evaluate that with the state to the left so that is the absolute value of the velocity u in the left in the left state and the speed of sound in the left state. And we take the similar value, the absolute value of the velocity u at the right state plus the speed of sound at the right state. So then we have locally the fastest wave speeds. No, no other can beat that. It is definitely then larger than the velocity itself, modulus velocity, or if say if u is positive, u minus c would then be smaller. If u would be negative, we have also taken that into account because we take the modulus here. So this is the fastest wave speed with the states left and right. And that is then used in here. And you see that is independent of delta t. Delta t doesn't enter this, but it has the same dimension as what we had here delta x over delta t that has the dimension of velocity and we also have velocity we have velocity speed of sound speed of sound is also dimension of velocity so that is the Rusanov or the local experience method and that is the one that you are using and then you can get some experience with that just the remark on this u plus c so the that is the spectral radius is that called the spectral radius both of the Jacobian matrix and the coefficient matrix that we called B yesterday. That is equal to the following 
that is the, well, it is defined as the maximum of the moduli of our eigenvalues. So in our case, we have three. We have u minus c, u and u plus c. And you can check that it's true that this is, in our case, is equal to the modulus of u plus the speed of sound. So again, the u here is the velocity. And then we can write it also the way we compute it, the rho u divided by rho. And the c is the square root of gamma pressure divided by density. That is the speed of sound. So they are entering here. So that is the spectral radius. And that is then guiding us uh, regarding the numerical viscosity. So that's similar as we did for the scalar uh, conservation laws. But there the problem was easier. We had only one wave speed. Here we have three. And we take the largest one. So that means we can expect rather good results really for the wave that is propagating with uh, this faster speed, but for the other ways we will have additional numerical dissipation. So you will see that when you do the exercise, uh, and it's also mentioned in the formulation that you cannot expect sharp results, because we have some numerical diffusion anyway, and we can just get rid of that, essentially by two ways. One way would be to have smaller grid spacing, so the delta x goes down, so goes the error down. And the other way would be to, do, to take a more accurate method. And that would be, for example, the method that I just want to mention now, that would be Rose method. Rose approximate Riemann solver is more accurate than uh, the local x method. And far more accurate than the lex method. So that brings us then to the part number six, section six, where we look at Rho's approximate Riemann solver. So I just want to give you the idea, not the details, you can read the details both in the textbook and in the lecture notes. So that is even better than Rusanov. That is then this method that is called after Phil Rowe, who devised that in 1980-81, Rowe's approximately one so. Builds upon the following, that is then 20, so that would be the flux function again at the phase j plus one half. And I think I just use the r here, that stands for rho, so the r stands here for rho in this case. It starts the same way as both the lux verdicts and the local lux verdicts. It starts with the average of the Euler flux function f evaluated with the left state and the Euler flux function evaluated with the right state. But then it uses not a scalar as we had here, but it uses a matrix. And that is then, we can formulate that in this way, is a hat. That is a special way to define the Jacobian matrix at the face j plus one half, and then it is u right minus u left. So this uh, is, has the same form as that. The difference is that we have now a matrix. You can already from that imagine that this is more costly in terms of computational time than the Rusanov method. 
So the a hat here, that is uh, a plus one half, that is the Jacobian matrix of the Euler flux function evaluated at a certain, called the, the row average, so at a certain state that is between UL and UR, defined in a, in a special way, uh, that is the Jacobian matrix. And uh, that is evaluated at what is called the row average. The row average. And it is determined such that is the catch. It is similar to the upwind method for the scalar conservation law, such that the jump in the flux, that is f of ur minus f of ul, is equal to this uh, Jacobian uh, matrix a hat j plus one half that we determined there times the jump in the conserved variance, and then we can solve the linearized problem for that exactly. So it's the same basic idea as for the scalar uh, conservation laws, but um, it's now more complex because we have to deal with now with this matrix. It essentially reduces the problem to the case where you assume you have discontinuities. All your waves, the, con the shock, the contact discontinuity, and the expansion tendons are all treated by dis as discontinuities. And that is also what we did saw in the, for the scalar conservation law. The upwind method just assumed that we have discontinuities. No matter whether, whether they were physical or non-physical. You have the same problem here. You might have an also expansion shock here, which is unphysical. So you have also to do an entropy fix. So that is the disadvantage of the method. One, has, one needs an entropy fix to avoid unphysical expansion shock. A method that does not need this fix, which also mentioned in the lecture notes, that is the method by Osher Solomon, it's from 1982, and by Pandolfi from 1984. They don't need that. So, so then we have the basic uh, building block, the Lima Solar. Usually we take the approximate one, and our favorite one is this one, because this is uh, reasonably okay, and it is simpler than the uh, than Rose one. So then we put that into the whole framework of the finite volume method, because all what we have been doing now is discussing how to determine the fluxes the flux at just the phase j plus one half. But remember, we need to do that for all phases. And then we need to compute the solution at the new time level. you will find also other methods that I do not mention here. For example, in the, also the textbook you will find other methods and also in, in further literature like in the textbook by Levesque on finite volume methods. So, instead we focus now on the finite volume method for the 1D Euler equations. And um, so the finite volume method for the 1D Euler equations that can be then written in the following way. We want we have what we have done so far is the spatial discretization. And then we have our flux approximation, and we bring that now on the right hand side, and we divide by the length of our interval 
uh, J, that is our control, our volume. So delta xj, and then we have here the flux balance for the phase will be fj plus one half that we have discussed, minus, that is the numerical flux at that phase, minus the numerical flux at the, east, at the western phase. And as I mentioned already several times, it is useful for the finite volume method to compute these fluxes once, because then you can reuse them. For example, if you have already calculated uh, the flux for the cell J minus 1, this, had, this was the eastern flux for that, so it is already available, so you can reuse it. So therefore it makes sense to use a vector for computing, or in that case the matrix, you want to do that for all, for, for evaluating the fluxes. So then we have done the discretization in space when we have done that. So in here then, the fj plus one half is some numerical flux function. Is a numerical flux function. For example, the um, for the local axis for example, the F J plus one half Rosen of all local axis and then this defines if we think of that, we have that in all the cells. This defines then a system of ordinary differential equations in time. We take the boundary conditions into account. I'll come to that later. And then we get the system of ODEs. So we get the system of ODEs if we do that for all the cells. And that would then look something like this. We have now the capital U is now the symbol for our unknown vectors at all the um, cells and the right hand side that is our residual so I'll define that the following way <coughs> and you can for example define them the u if you like as um, you, you have the unknown vector so the u1 is then the vector of the conserved variables rho, rho u, rho e in the first cell then you have u2 and so on and you have the u and j. So you could put them in that way. So in that way you would get the 3 by nj matrix. So that would be the vector of state of the conservative variables. So vector, or I call it here now state vectors. Vector of state vectors. u, j. So this is the solution <coughs> of the first cell and so on, this is the one in the last cell. And the R, that is then the residual. The R is then similarly defined as R1 to Rnj, that is the residual, the vector of residual vectors. And, uh, well, the, if you want to know the Rj, then you have it just here. So that would be the, the Rj. If you want to do, for example, the TBD Rango Kata method, you would define the residual by that, by the right hand side of this equation. You would do that for all the cells, <coughs> and then you can apply uh, the TBD Rango Kata method by calling the residual with every value for each stage. So that makes the programming then rather uh, modular and uh, easy. So I've already mentioned now that what we do the next is then to solve this system of ODEs by our favorite ODE method. So the, the system of equations is solved 
find uh, appropriate OE method. And the one that we have been using mostly that was has been the explicit Euler method. That is the simplest. We could also use the TBD Ramakata method. And so that is the third order that we saw. It's the TBD Ramakata uh, third order method, or we could, could use um, implicit methods, whatever, whatever we like, semi-implicit methods, and so on. The implicit methods would be more difficult, because we would have to solve a nonlinear system in each time step. So we essentially focus on the explicit Euler method, and on the third order PVD run method. If we do that, if we choose either of them, then we have an explicit method. And explicit methods, for them we have a stability bound. And uh, so, that, it's the same as for the scalar conservation laws. For the explicit methods, we get a uh, stability condition or a CFL condition. And that is usually of the following kind, that we say that our the maximum of the local current numbers CK, that is then the maximum over all J. And here we have now to look for the fastest wave speed again. And that is, as we saw before, the spectral radius, which is then the absolute value of U in the cell. And that is again the velocity and the speed of sound. So today, that is, that is the fastest wave speed. That times delta T divided by delta x, we take the maximum, but it has to be smaller in some bound. And usually for, say, for the explicit Euler method, this bound C max is 1. For the TBD Rangakata method, we can choose it larger. So that would be the C max would be 1 for the explicit Euler method. And that can be motivated by looking at our uh, characteristic form of the equations. Because in the characteristic form of the equations, we get scalar equations. And then we can essentially apply what we know about stability for those, and then get results for the system that we want to solve. So, um, when we look at the characteristic form, of the, the one of the other equations, then we get scalar equations and we get the, the characteristic variable WL, we get the time derivative, plus we get the lambda L, which is the characteristic speed, times the space derivative is equal to zero. And when we apply, um, when we use this, and we use then our favorite method, and we do that, we check that for the good enough, for, for the Rusanov method, then you will find out you will get something that you know. And the CFL condition for this will be that is so if we use say the say if we would use the upwind method for example for that uh, for this equation um, has the CFL condition 
that we say the um, absolute value of CL, that is the lambda L, times the delta T divided by delta X, is smaller than equal 1, if we do that, for example, for the explicit Euler. That is what we have been using all the time. And now, in our case, we then do that for all the waves that we have. We do it for wave 1, 2 and 3. And then we find out that, in the end, it must be satisfied for the largest of those. So, satisfied, so this condition is satisfied for all L, in our case from 1, for L1, 2 and 3, for uh, the, um, if we have the, let's see, we call it, if, the, if in our case the maximum of the L, lambda L, delta T, divided by delta x is more than equal than 1. And this here, that is in our case, as we have discussed just before when we discussed the spectral radius, this is the absolute value of u plus the speed of sound, delta t divided by delta x. So that has to be then smaller than equal than 1. So that has to be valid for each cell, and then we get arrive finally at this condition. So when we take the maximum of the fastest wave speed in here, then, and in our case for explicit Euler method this would be 1, then we have our stability condition. And for the TBD run cutter method, you can use a C max uh, for, you can use the C max about 1.5 for the TVD RK3 method. However, if you use muscle, then the stability limit goes down. So that is for, for first order. And, but you should use the C max about 1. Some people even use 1 half here for the TVD Ranga cutter when you use muscle. So that is something that some of you have also experienced in exercise 4. The method did not work with the muscle for current number 1, with the explicit Euler method. But for the TVD Ranga cutter method, it does. So for exercise uh, uh, 4, you could use the CMAX1 with the explicit Euler method, but for the muscle it did not work. It worked for 0 0.3, but uh, it is unsafe. So I recommend you to use the TVD Runger Cutter method if you use muscle. So you might run into difficulties even if you uh, have um, to use smaller current numbers. So that is something one has to be aware of when doing these computations, that the stability bound, that is a disadvantage with the TVD approach, uh, with the muscle approach, that the stability bound, as you see here, goes down when you use this higher order method. And for the explicit Euler method, it might not even work. Okay, so then we stop here. Boundary conditions after that.